year 10 and 11, welcome to your AQA English Language Paper 1 Section B video. This is the writing question, it is question 5, and this video is going to focus on structure. How we can structure our descriptive and creative writing for maximum impact. A quick reminder of the assessment objectives for the writing question are here. Assessment objective five is communicate clearly, effectively and imaginatively, selecting and adapting tone, style and register for different forms, purposes and audiences. Organise information and ideas using structural and grammatical features to support coherence and cohesion of texts. So basically we're going to be focusing on structure here. So that's um, kind of that assessment objective but if you also look in assessment objective six where it says that you use sentence structures for clarity purpose and effect we're also going to look there so remember we are always thinking here in this video about how we can have maximum influence on the reader are we structuring our work to manipulate the reader's feelings and emotions and how they respond so this sounds silly, but first off, what does the word structure mean? Well, the word structure means how something is arranged, how it is organised or constructed. And that is exactly what we need to think of. We've got to get out of the habit of just writing down everything um, we can think of and start thinking about where we can place certain devices so that the reader is affected. Okay? So we have to be very conscious about what we're doing. If you check out my video for the first video for the writing paper, I go through something called slow writing and that is a wonderful way of consciously considering where to place things and why. So this is the first thing I just want you to have a look at. So on this slide I have given you the sentence she loved him and I've asked you to add the word only to it in different places to see what happens then. So the first one I, I've written down is she loved him only. She only loved him. She loved only him. Only she loved him. Now again this is just a very quick thing to show you how structuring sentences can impact meaning. So again just read those sentences back. She loved him only. She only loved him. She loved only him. Only she loved him. And then there is a slight change in meaning. And that was just one quick way I wanted to show you. Um, in terms of punctuation can be very important. I'm going to come to punctuation a little a little bit later. I've got some questions I want you to consider. And then we're going to look at an extract of Gone Girl and think, and, and think about order. So these are the questions you should always consider when you are doing your own writing. We can also use this when considering reading as well. Um, on the structure question on the... Um, on the reading section. What is the opening sentence of the paragraph like? What mood does it create? So straight away when we're writing, we've got to think about how we begin. Who or what does the writer get us to focus on at the beginning? And what is the effect? If we're writing about setting, what is the setting? Is there anything particular about the weather or the landscape which creates a certain mood? Again, if you look at my video on slow writing, you describe a tornado, it's all there. Does the focus of the mood change at any point? What is the effect of this change? Pinpoint the exact word or sentence where there is a moment of change. What kind of word or sentence have you picked out? What is the precise effect? Are there any ex examples of repetition, dialogue, or sentence structures which seem out of the ordinary? What might be the effect of these choices? How does the text finish? How is this different or similar from what you noticed at the start? So there's just a few questions to consider about when you're reading a text and also when you're, doing your, when you're doing your own. You always, I think, should start in quite a powerful way because, remember, you're trying to get someone to continue reading. And if they're bored instantly, um, you're really going to have to struggle to, to win them over as they read. So consider those questions and then we're going to look at Gone Girl. And what I've done is I have muddled up the actual extract. Um, and you were going to, just as a quick, as I say, practice, try and reorder the lines for, for what you think would be the best way of influencing the reader. So just a reminder on the slide there, you're going to read the following extract of Gone Girl, which is muddled up. Try and reorder the lines 
into what you think is best, adding the punctuation and paragraph. And as I say there in yellow, you are trying to manipulate the reader. So here's the extract. It begins with Nick Dunn, the D of. We can leave that there. I suppose these questions storm cloud over every marriage. When I think of my wife, I always think of her head. What will we do? Like a shiny hard corn kernel or a riverbed fossil. Her brain, all those coils and her thoughts shuttling through those coils like fast frantic centipedes. The very first time I saw her, it was the back of the head I saw and there was something lovely about it. The angles of it. What are you thinking? Amy, what are you thinking? And what's inside it? I think of that too. Her mind. The shape of it to begin with. Thoughts. The question I've asked most often during our marriage, if not out loud, if not to the person who could answer. She had what the Victorians would call a finely shaped head. Who are you? You could imagine the skull quite easily. Like a child, I picture opening her skull, unspooling her brain and sifting through it, trying to catch and pin down her thoughts. I'd know her head anyway. How are you feeling? What have we done to each other? So, as I say, as just a, a practice, if you're using this video as a, a real form of revision, try to reorder that paragraph so that it is in an order that you think manipulates the reader and you have to add the punctuation and the paragraphing to the piece. So pause the video to do that and then I will bring up the actual extract and what that would look like. So if we have a look here... This is what it looked like online. Um, the book version that I've got actually is slightly different. But anyway, we're focusing on structure. So you've got this. Nick Dunn, the day of. When I think of my wife, I always think of her head. The shape of it to begin with. The very first time I saw her, it was the back of her head I saw. And there was something lovely about it. The angles of it. Like a shiny, hard corn kernel or a riverbed fossil. She had what the Victorians would call a finely shaped head. You could imagine the skull quite easily. I'd know her head anyway. And what's inside it? I think of that too. Her mind. Her brain. All those coils. And her thoughts shuttling through those coils like fast, frantic centipedes. Like a child. I picture opening her skull, unspooling her brain and sifting through it, trying to catch and pin down her thoughts. What are you thinking, Amy? The question I've asked mo most often during our marriage, if not out loud, if not to the person who could answer. I suppose these questions storm cloud over every marriage. What are you thinking? How are you feeling? Who are you? What have we done to each other? What will we do? So again, if you're looking at structure, you've got the first sentence, a complex sentence, but it's out of the ordinary, isn't it? Most people, most men wouldn't say that when they think of their wife, they consider her head. Then he goes into detail about describing it. He uses a simile at the, be at the beginning of a sentence, like a, shard, a shiny, hard corn kernel. We've got that sentence that's used for impact all on its own. I'd know her head anyway. That's quite creepy to a certain degree, isn't it? And what's inside it? Short sentence for punch. Now... He's saying that he knows his wife very well, but then at the end we've got a bombardment of questions as if actually he doesn't really know his wife. He doesn't really know what she's thinking. You've got the rhetorical questions. You've got a varied use of the comma that works for structural reasons. So that was just to show you that we can structure things very easily without overthinking it for maximum impact. If you really wanted to test yourself, you could answer those questions based on the Gone Girl extract I have given you. If not, we're going to move to just a range of structural devices that we might want to use. I'm going to list what I think is the most obvious structural devices to use and probably the easiest ones. Um, but there's more because I do want to move on to the colon and the semicolon. Um in terms of how they can be used to structure things. So rhetorical question is one of the easiest things. It does manipulate the reader because the reader is forced to consider an answer. Another quite straightforward device to use in terms of really adding punch to something is a one word sentence. 
One word sentence can begin a piece, it can end a piece, it can divide paragraphs. You've got to be very careful though, because as I say, the word you select really does has, have to have power and impact behind it. You can't just put any word there. Um, so again, if you consult my video about slow writing, I start the piece on the thunderstorm and the tornado with the word ominous. So again, it's, it kind of almost creates mood in, in a single word. So again, consider that. Simple sentences, again, when they are used, they can draw attention to something. I'll use of mice and men as an example, just because most people will have read it. When George shoots Lenny, the simple sentence says, he pulled the trigger. Simple sentences, again, can be used as a paragraph all in, on their own. Because usually we want the simple sentence to stand out. We want it to be something that the reader remembers, that the reader is affected by. Repetition is another wonderful device that can be used to impact the reader's response if they are... Um, consistently being drawn to something then it will naturally affect their response and their emotions again make it something worth repeating again I'll just use of mice and men because it's something familiar when we first meet Curly's wife and we hear about the colour red and we hear rouge and every time we see her we, we kind of get a, a mention of the colour red and it, the, that repetition there is is for uh, symbolism. Steinbeck's trying to warn us that she is going to play a big part in the lives of the main characters and that, that it is a warning to us as a reader that she is potential danger. So, the, 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 I think the most simple structural devices, rhetorical question, your one word sentence, your simple sentence, repetition. You can add on to that though, um, the ellipsis. A lot of people like to use the ellipsis again be careful where we do that. We don't want to write something cliched and overused, like at the end of a piece, I woke up, dot, dot, dot. That's not very creative. So if we're going to use the ellipsis, think carefully about where and why. Okay. Again, another quick task for you, if you're taking this video as something you can use as revision, I've given you a muddled up extract from Pretty Little Liars, if anybody's read that. And again, I'm not going to show you the answer this time like I did with Gone Girl. What I want you to do is either make, pause the video and make a note of those sentences and think about where we can place them for maximum impact. By all means, play around with it. So you've got, she paused to listen to the wind which shook violently. Emily lay still on her bed thinking about prison. Maybe she'd never taste again. Emily lay still on her bed thinking about prison. Should I, she thought. She thought about what others would think of her. Locked up forever. Forever. What if she ran? Maybe she'd never feel again. Then she slipped out the door, not bothering to take a key. If we just have a look at these sentences on their own. You have got your one word sentence forever. You have got your rhetorical question. What if she ran? You have got the use of the dash down there at the bottom. So you get the emphasis of the second part of the sentence. Look at that, she thought about what others would think of her, dash, locked up forever. You've got clever use of the comma again, Emily lay still on her bed, comma, thinking about prison. So the second part of the sentence there about prison has extra punch and power. And we've got that sentence twice, look, for repetition purposes. Then, comma, she slipped out the door, comma, not bothering to take a key. So the, um, the main clause, she slipped out the door, is emphasised. Should I, she thought. So a lot of the devices that we've just went over have been used here. So that's what I mean about these devices being the easiest ones to use. We don't have to overthink it. What we do have to think is, where shall I place them in my work for maximum impact? We'll just have 
um, a discussion about this paragraph, which is from Stephen King's The Mist, and then we will ourselves look at the colon and the semicolon. So you've got this extract. Um, Tendrils of mist as white and fine as floating lace eddied inside. The air was cold. It had been noticeably cool all morning long, especially after the sticky heat of the last three weeks. But it had been a summery coolness. This was cold. It was like March. I shivered. A tentacle came over the far lip of the concrete loading platform and grabbed Norm around the calf. My mouth dropped wide open. Ollie made a very short, glottal sound of surprise. Ugh. The tentacle tapered from a thickness of a foot, the size of a grass snake, at the point where it had wrapped itself around Norm's leg to a thickness of four or five feet where it disappeared into the mist. It was ciliate grey on top, shading to a fleshy pink underneath. They were moving and writhing like hundreds of small, puckering mouths. I was closest, so I grabbed the tentacle. It was like stretching a rubber band. The tentacle yielded but gave up its basic grip. Then, three more tentacles floated out of the mist towards us. They slithered aimlessly back and forth on the platform. I felt it touch my arm. It was warm and pulsing and smooth. So if we just have a look at this punctuation here, um, you can see that... And, and the simple sentence is actually, we get the air was cold. So straight away, second sentence in, we have atmosphere. Now, if we are told that something is cold, naturally the effect on the reader there is that we emotionally feel that way as well. And a lot of the times when something is cold or a setting is described as cold and bare, etc., we can transfer that to our emotions. We probably don't expect anything happy to happen here. And then we get three short sentences for impact. This was cold. It was like March. I shivered. Now, I shivered is probably a main one because it is the shortest sentence, but it finishes the paragraph. So there's another um, instance of structure. We've been told it's cold. Now we're told that the character is shivering. Now, again, when we think about shivering, we can apply it to weather and we can apply it to fear. So the reader is being manipulated here. Is this something that he should fear? Naturally, again from structure, we get it in the next paragraph. Straight away, a tentacle. So look at your structure there. The reader initially feels fear, and then we know we have to feel fear because there's a tentacle grabbing people. In the next paragraph, we have got the dash again, look. Like when I showed you from the Pretty Little Liars extract. Ollie made a very short glottal sound of surprise. Then we get the pause, then we get ook. The pause there again adds that tension and he makes he makes a noise that's almost inhumane, animal-like as he responds to this alien creature. The tentacle tapered from a thickness of a foot and then we get again our dashes, the size of a grass snake at the point where, now look at the size of a grass snake, because of the punctuation and the structuring of the sentence, that is left all on its own. So it's isolated and therefore emphasised. Once again... As a reader, what do we associate with a snake? Something dangerous, venomous, a, a, a lot of people will fear it. Structure there then has a massive impact on the reader. It wouldn't be the same sentence if it said the tentacle was like a grass snake. Okay, so the, look at the punctuation. It's, it's done on purpose, isn't it? If we move down to the last bit, then comma, look at that, then comma, again it's suspense, the reader thinks, oh my god, what's going to happen next, we've already had this thing grabbing people's legs, and it's got uh, puckering mouths, and it's clearly a, not an, an animal that we know of, then three more tentacles floated out of the mist towards us, so you've got that pause, and the punch of the fact that there's more tentacles where the other one came from, and then look again, simple sentence, I felt it touch my arm, Bang! The reader thinks, oh my God, the main characters are going to die. There's tentacles floating all over and grabbing people. So look at that. The use of this simple sentence here and the use of punctuation makes the reader fearful and feel tense. I've got some questions that you might want to consider answering based on this before we move to the colon and the semicolon. So here's just five questions. Again, if you're really testing yourself, um, about this extract. So your questions then are, what is the effect of the short, simple sentence, I shivered? 
And why does it finish the paragraph? Why does the second paragraph begin with a tentacle? Why does Stephen King use the dash in the following sentence? The tentacle tapered from a thickness of a foot, dash, the size of a grass snake, dash, at the point where it had wrapped itself around Norm's leg. Question four. Why does the second paragraph end with puckering mouths? And five, what is the effect of the simple sentence, I felt it touch my arm? Okay, so again, questions to consider all involving punctuation, structure, sentence choice. We will now look at colon and semicolon. The semicolon then is used to separate two closely related clauses. For example, Bill was going bald, semicolon, his hair was falling out. Now, both of those clauses um, are related to Bill and his hair and him going bald. And the semicolon then is used there just to kind of closely link them. Bill was going bald, semicolon, his hair was falling out. So it's, as I say, a semicolon joins two independent clauses and it connects them together. Okay. Now, let's move to the colon. I'm going to show you two different ways to use the colon. I'm not going to look at the list because I'm sure you've been taught how to use the colon in a list and I'm not so sure that that actually helps us with the descriptive writing and creative writing. So I'm going to show you the two ways that you could use it in your descriptive writing. So this is the first one. The colon is used between independent clauses when the second explains or illustrates the first. Sounds complicated but isn't. I've given you a couple of examples here. I have very little time to learn the language, colon, my new job starts in five weeks. So there you can see that the second part, my new job starts in five weeks, explains why you have little time to learn language. Notice that they are independent clauses so they can stand alone as sentences themselves. Your next example. A college degree is still worth something. Call on. A recent survey revealed that college graduates earned roughly 60% more than those with only a high school diploma. So again, the second part of that sentence is illustrating the first, explaining why a college degree is worth something. Again, both parts, before and after the colon, can stand alone. And the last one, all three of their children are involved in the arts. Richard is a sculptor, Diane is a pianist, and Julie is a theatre director. Again, the third, the sorry, the second part of that sentence, the bit after the colon, um, is backing up slash illustrating, explaining who the children are. Straightforward, we need not overthink it. We're going to move to the second use of the colon, which is my favourite use of the colon, and which I do think will have massive impact in terms of the structure of your sentences in a piece of descriptive writing, in a, in a piece of creative writing, and that is for emphasis. So let's have a look at that. So the colon can be used to emphasize a phrase or a single word at the end of a sentence. So you can see already by the meaning that that, that could be crucial in terms of manipulation of the reader. So if we look, after three weeks of deliberation, the jury finally reached a verdict, colon, guilty. Look at that, colon. Not only does it help build suspense and tension, as the reader wonders what the verdict is, but it then emphasises the final word, which is guilty. Now, interestingly, and I was always taught, that this, the, the bit before the colon should be a sentence on its own. After three weeks of deliberation, the jury finally reached a verdict. That is a sentence on its own. The colon follows it. Okay? And in the second example, that's kind of been swapped round so that the sentence follows the colon. So five continents, three dozen countries, over 100 cities, colon. This was the trip of a lifetime. So naturally, the second part of that sentence is what's emphasised, that this trip was going to change lives. So again, the colon, if we're talking about structure and we're talking about 
affecting or manipulating a reader, then we should try and use it for emphasis. Uh, that top sentence is wonderful, isn't it? The, the way the word guilty is emphasised. If you want to practice, why don't you try writing three of your own? And just, just for the top example there, just ensure that there's a sentence before the colon, before what's emphasised. I'm going to move to the dash now. So we can have a look at the dash because we've mentioned it a couple of times in this video. The dash, again, we need not overthink the dash. It takes the place of commas. I've got a couple of examples here. Thousands of children dash, like the girls in Mumbai dash, have been left homeless. So when we take out the middle, we still have a sentence. Thousands of children have been left homeless. What the dash does there is it emphasises the fact that there's girls in Mumbai, thousands of them, who don't have homes. So you've got that, that shock factor. Now, what it also does, um, it's to show other kinds of breaks in a sentence. So, for instance, it can replace not only the comma, the semicolon and the colon as well. So we've got a huge variation already of punctuation because we're already going to be using the full stop and the comma. That goes without saying. We're probably going to be using a question mark for our rhetorical question. Now, if we use the colon, semicolon and dash once each, we have got a vast range to show the examiner. So the examples there are one thing's for sure, dash, he doesn't want to face the truth. That obviously could be a colon, couldn't it? It could be a comma. Next example, things have changed a lot in the last year, mainly for the better. Again, it could be a colon. It could be a comma. So the dash is something dead straightforward that we can use to replace a comma, a semicolon or a colon. Don't overuse it. We don't want to look silly. Maybe he's use it once or twice is enough. What we're going to do now is have a look at an extract from Frankenstein and look at Mary Shelley's use of punctuation. As practice, if you, as I say, are using this video to really test yourself, I'm going to show you an extract from Frankenstein. Consider this, or answer this if you're practising. How does Mary Shelley use structure and punctuation to interest the reader? Consider short, simple sentences, colon, semicolon, exclamation mark. Also, I've missed off there, sorry, how uh, sentences and paragraphs begin and end. And this is the extract. So, this is from chapter 7. Victor is telling Captain Walton his story. After deserting the monster, Victor fled on a tour to Europe in the hope to forget his creature, which he deemed dead. On his return to Geneva, his hometown, he learned that his little brother William had been murdered in mysterious circumstances. Right, so he's just learned that his brother's been murdered. This is the extract you're looking at. William, dear angel, this is thy funeral. This thy dirge. As I said these words, I perceived in the gloom a figure which stole from behind a clump of trees near me. I stood fixed, gazing intently. I could not be mistaken. A flash of lightning illuminated the object and discovered its shape plainly to me. Its gigantic stature and the deformity of its aspect, more hideous than belongs to humanity, instantly informed me that it was the wretch, the filthy demon to whom I had given life. Could he be... I shuddered at the conception, the murderer of my brother. No sooner did that idea cross my imagination than I became convinced of its truth. My teeth chattered and I was forced to lean against a tree for support. The figure passed me quickly and I lost it in the gloom. Nothing in human shape could have destroyed that fair child. He was the murderer. I could not doubt it. The mere presence of the idea was an irresistible proof of the fact. I thought of pursuing the devil but it would have been in vain, for another flash discovered him to me hanging among the rocks of the nearly perpendicular ascent of Mont... I'm not very good at pronouncing these uh, French words, so you can do that one. A hill that bounds, again, on the south. He soon reached the summit and disappeared. So again, consider the question I gave you about structure, but if we just want to have a quick discussion um, in terms of punctuation, sentences... Um, you can see then that Shelley's very clever with her punctuation, isn't she? Um, you've got your semicolon. And after, and, and after the semicolon, I stood fixed, comma. Suspense. The reader thinks, oh, oh, oh no. 
be staring at this figure. Is it the monster? Is it Frankenstein? And then look at the colon to follow as well. I could not be mistaken. So I could not be mistaken gets emphasised further. So that sentence, there's a lot of suspense created and the pauses through the punctuation force the reader to fear the idea that it's the monster that has killed the brother. If we carry on, you have got um, these of the commas here, which segregate the filthy demon. So again, that we are being told that the monster Victor created is a demon, so therefore we associate with the devil, etc., and has killed his brother. And after that, look, to whom I had given life, so it's his own fault that his brother has died. And then look at the next sentence. It does use brackets. I know we haven't discussed that, but actually brackets, again, do the same as the dash and the comma. Could he be? I shuddered at the conception. The murder of my brother. So the bit in your brackets is emphasised that he's petrified that the monster he's made killed his brother. And we've got our rhetorical question, which I've told you is a key thing for structure. Um... He was the murderer, simple sentence with an exclamation mark. So it's got that huge emotive factor. It's, it's the emotion of guilt. He has caused the death of his own brother. Simple sentence again, I could not doubt it. So two very powerful short sentences. He was the murderer, I could not doubt it. And look at the final sentence there. He soon reached the summit, comma, and disappeared. Why have we got a comma there? Because the last two words of the paragraph are used for maximum impact. He soon reached the summit and disappeared. So the reader is left petrified that the monster has escaped and we don't know where he is and we don't know what he's going to do. I've got one final little test for you before we look at perhaps our own writing. And it's this, I'm going to show you an extract from Stephen King's Misery. And we're going to look at punctuation. But when you read it, this is what we're going to follow the following rules. For every full stop, we're going to pause for two seconds. Every comma, two seconds. Colon and semicolon for two seconds. Dash, three seconds. Question mark, four seconds. Paragraph change, five seconds. The reason being, we're just looking at the pauses and how Stephen King builds suspense and tension for the reader, which is essentially, I suppose, what we want to try and transfer to our own writing. So here is the extract. So remember our pauses and let's give the reading of this extract in terms of looking at suspense ago. So, but sometimes the sounds, like the pain, faded. And then there was only the haze. He remembered darkness. Solid darkness had come before the haze. Did that mean he was making progress? Let there be light, even of the hazy variety. And the light was good. And so on, and so on. Had those sounds existed in the darkness? He didn't know the answers to any of these questions. Did it make sense to ask them? He didn't know the answer to that one, either. The pain was somehow below the sounds. The pain was east of the sun and south of his ears. That was all he did know. For some length of time that seemed very long. And so was, since the pain and the stormy haze were the only two things which existed. Those sounds were the only outer reality. He had no idea who he was or where he was and cared to know neither. He wished he was dead. But through the pain-soaked tears that filled his mind like a summer storm cloud, he did not know he wished it. I'm just going to stop the extract there so I'm not 
going on and on and on. Um, so if we just, again, if you look at your opening par two paragraphs, you can clearly see how Stephen King has consciously used punctuation to affect us. Now, his use of the dash here is wonderful because it emphasises pain. So we know that this man is in pain. We also get our call on. He remembered darkness. Notice that that's a sentence that will stand on its own. Solid darkness had come before the haze. So repetition of darkness as a structural device. Then we get our rhetorical questions. I did see that those were classic devices to use. We get quite a few actually, don't we? When we, when we look closely. Look at also the comma there where it's got a word emphasised after it. Could have used the colon. And then we get a very short paragraph. The pain was somewhere below the sounds. Repetition. The pain was east of the sun and south of his ears. That was all he did know. Okay? So we can see very clearly how Stephen King uses punctuation. What you, want, what you might want to do there, I gave you the pauses, didn't I, of two seconds, three seconds. Why don't you experiment pausing in terms of one second or two or three and see what effect it has? See if it does change um, the influence on the reader and, and whether or not it changes the effect. I want to bring up a task now if you are using this video as, as proper revision in terms of testing yourself. I want to put a task on um, with success criteria that you might want to attempt to have a go at. So there's a choice here. Imagine you are Anne Boleyn, describe waiting to be beheaded or imagine you are King Henry VIII and you have sentenced your wife, the Queen of England, to death. Describe waiting for her to be beheaded. So that's the task. Um, pick one, obviously, or you can do both, I suppose. Um, and I'll bring up your success criteria in terms of what you should follow. And then have a go. Have a go at, write, at writing in terms of structure, in terms of manipulating the reader, in terms of punctuation, paragraphing. Does the reader feel suspense? Remember, if you are waiting to be beheaded, we want to feel tension. And likewise, he has sentenced his wife to be beheaded. Perhaps he does feel slightly guilty. I don't know. Okay, so think carefully. And this is the success criteria I would use, and it, goes, it covers two slides. So let's make sure that as part of our success criteria, we use the colon, the semicolon, the dash, a one-word sentence, a simple sentence for effect and for punch, and consider how and when you change your paragraph, for example, using a rhetorical question. An additional way of testing yourself might be this. I begin in an attention-grabbing way, including a language device. I used a one-word sentence effectively. I have used a thought-provoking rhetorical question to end a paragraph. Repetition has been used effectively. Simple, sentence are simple sentences are used in a memorable way. I have used the colon, semicolon and dash effectively. So as I say, test yourself there. See if you can use all of those things for maximum impact so the reader feels manipulated, so the reader pauses when you force them to, so the reader feels on edge because they don't know what, perhaps what's going to happen next. I hope this video has been useful. Um, please check out the first part of this video. Um, excuse, apologies for that noise. Please check out the first part of this video which goes through slow writing. And slow writing is important because it allows you to consciously consider your writing and the structure of your writing and what you are placing in particular positions. So check out my first video, which is about, about slow writing. And it's titled AQA, English Language, Paper 1, Section B. Um, if you need any more my videos, just type my name into YouTube. It's Stacey Ray, S-T-A-C. A Y and Ray is R E A Y and good luck in your English language exam.